There we go. Thank you, everybody. Welcome and um, thank you so much for joining us tonight for the Board of Directors meeting. It's Wednesday, August 18th, 2021, and uh, this is the Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting. I'm Ashley Stolzman. I'm the chair of Dr. Cog, and I'll be presiding over the meeting this evening. We're still working on getting members uh, moved over into the participant uh, panel, so we'll keep working on that as I get started here and just a, a little update for people who have just joined. And if you've updated your Zoom, uh, the new version will ask you to accept being promoted. So if you get a pop-up that pops up and says, would you like to be promoted to a panelist, please say yes. And then we'll get everybody over. So with that, I will turn it over um, to Melinda Stevens for our roll call. And she'll tell us if there are any new members and alternates here tonight. And um, if people are stuck over the attendee side and need to be moved over, we'll make sure we handle that too after the roll call. So don't worry too much. If you get skipped, we'll get it all sorted out. With that, Melinda, take it away. Fantastic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, at this point in time, we do not have any new members or alternates to announce. So I will get right into roll call. All right, Aaron Brockett of Boulder. Present. Adam Cushing of Brighton. Present. Adam Zarin of the governor's office. Allison Coombs of Aurora. Present. Anita Seitz of Westminster. Present. Bill Gipp of Erie. Sarah Laughlin of Erie. Bill Van Meter of RTD. Bob Pfeiffer of Arvada. John Marriott of Arvada. Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Good evening. Happy to be here tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Bud. Uh, Claire Levy of Boulder County. Present. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. Present. Thank you. Thank you. David Spellman of Blackhawk. Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines. Roger Hudson of Castle Pines. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber of Greenwood Village. Present. George Teal of Douglas County. Abe Layden of Douglas County. Jacob LeBure of Lakewood. Dana Gutwine of Lakewood. Jim Dale of Golden. Here. Paul Hack. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Jim. Uh, James Kumerly of Lock Bowie. Jamie Jeffrey of Lock Bowie. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz of Castle Rock. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Here. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. I'm here. Thank you. Joan Peck of Longmont. I'm here. S sorry, Tim Dean is here. Oh, thank you so much, Tim. Appreciate that. Yes. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Present. Julie Duran Mullica of North Glen. Joyce Downing of North Glen. Kara Tanucci of Central City. Jeremy Fay of Central City. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Jackie Thomas of Decono. Kevin Flynn of Denver. Here. Christopher Larson of Nederland. Larry Vidham of Bennett. Here. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Celeste Arner of Federal Heights. <clears throat> Linda Olson of Inglewood. Cheryl Wink of Inglewood. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Here. Margot Ramson of Bomar. Michael Hillman of Idaho Springs. Neil Shaw of Superior. Here. Nicholas Angelo of Lyons. 
Holly Rogan of Lions, Nicholas Williams of Denver. Here. Nicole Frank of Commerce City. Present. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Present. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Russell Stewart of Cherry Hills Village. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. Here. Rebecca White of CDOT. Roy Palmer of Columbine Valley. Gail Christie of Columbine Valley. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Tim Barnes of Lafayette. I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca of Adams County. <coughs> Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Good evening, here. Thank you. Tammy Maurer of Centennial. Here. Thank you. Tracy Craft Tharp of Jefferson County. Yes. William Lindstedt of Broomfield. I am here. Okay. Wynn Shaw of Lone Tree. Present. All right, great. And, and as the chair noted, uh, if there's anyone that we left over, um, just raise your hand. All right, and I'll- okay, um, There you go. Just double check. The person who's listed as council, we can get you renamed if I find out who you are. And I don't see where that person went. Um, so first I'm just gonna um, allow, Let's the person named Council. Let's um, just find out who you are really quick. Sorry about that. It looks like you're muted on your end, Marie. Okay, uh, uh, Mike Hoffman Aurora filling in for uh, uh, Council Member Allison Coombs. Oh, thank you, uh, Mayor. I think Allison made it, and so you're perfect. Oh, she did. Yep, I think you're perfect. There you are. Thank you so much, and you're yes. absolutely welcome to continue to attend. And then the other person uh, over in the panel that we're just going to check on, Marie Venner. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks so much for taking comments. Oh, I'm a so we're not quite, Sorry, Marie, oh, I'll come to you okay. in just a second for public comment. I was just checking to see if you were one of the um, directors and needed to be mo moved over to the panelists. So keep your hand up and we'll get to you in just one moment for your comment. Sorry about that. All right, I think we have everybody where they need to be for now. Thank you so much. Um, and so that takes us to the uh, approval of the agenda. Can I please get a motion to approve the agenda? This is Sally from Sheridan. I will move to approve the agenda. And now you Thank know you. I'm here. Thank you, Director Daigle and um, Director Starker. Would you like to second it? Why? Oh, sorry about that, Director Starker. You've gotten muted. There you go. Then uh, I would like to second that motion. Great, thank you very much, Director Starker. Any conversation on the approval of the agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the uh, agenda is approved and we can go on. Next, we have the report of the chair and I'll turn it over to the Performance and Engagement Committee Chair to give us a report on performance and engagement, Director Conklin. Thank you very much. Uh, we met on Wednesday, August 4th, and we had three items on our agenda. The first was to talk about the board workshop, which I think everyone is aware has been postponed into early 22, uh, 2022. Uh, the desire was to have a workshop that, that a lot of people can attend. And the thought was that, that given current circumstances, we were not gonna have the attendance we were hoping for. I do wanna thank staff and also the committee members for putting together what I think was a great agenda that we were looking forward to having. Uh, a lot of those things from the agenda will move into other spots, board workshop sessions, those type of things, and we will plan a great session for early 2022. We also talked about the process for selecting Dr. Cog's representatives to the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board of Directors, and I believe we came up to the consensus that that would be handled by our nominating committee. Also, we had uh, Randy Arnold present to talk about Dr. Cog's executive director annual performance uh, evaluation process, which will be starting very soon. 
So look for more information on that coming to you uh, in the next month or so. Thank you. That's my report. Thank you very much, Director Conklin. And that'll take us to a report from Finance and Budget Committee, Director Shaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, Finance and Budget approved two items this evening, a resolution authorizing the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract with CDOT for consolidated, consolidated planning grant funding in support of fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 2023 unified planning work program in an amount up to 18.9 million for the period beginning October 1st, 2021 and running through September 30th, 2023. The second item was a resolution authorizing the executive director to accept funds from CDOT, or I'm sorry, the Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies, DORA, up to $200,000 for approximately 18 months ending September 30th, 2022, to administer a regional state health insurance assistant program, uh, aka SHIP. This concludes my report. Thank you, Director Shaw. And now it's my pleasure to introduce everyone to our Executive Director, Doug Rex, for his report. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And good evening, everybody. Um, uh, Director Conklin, he already mentioned the postponement, and he's exactly right. The the uh, items that we were planning on having on the on the uh, um, workshop agenda, we are planning on I'm presenting those in some shape or fashion during the during the fall at a work session or an upcoming uh, actual business business meeting. So stay tuned on that. Um, small Communities Hot Topics Forum. Um, we're we're planning on hosting our sixth annual Small Communities Hot Topics Forum in late late October. And for those that are new to the board, this is an event that's geared towards our smaller communities in the region. And the agenda is really tailored uh, based on the feedback that we get from 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 those from those smaller members. So, um, uh, you know, we're still finalizing the details, but if there are specific topics you would like to see addressed in this forum, please send those to myself or, um, or Dr. Flo Rotano on staff. Uh, an update on Regional Vision Zero. Many of you may recall that the board adopted taking action on Regional Vision Zero last year. One of the first big implementation steps for us is a public education campaign. Um, and our initiative, this, this whole initiative of taking action of, on regional vision zero, the regional uh, uh, concept of that, it's, it's one of the only region-wide efforts in the country. And this first education campaign will begin next week, specifically focused on slow speeding. What is slow speeding? I know that's what you're probably asking yourself, but it's, um, so the slow speeding message will highlight the fact that one of the most dangerous kinds of speeding doesn't, doesn't even look like speeding at all. Our data shows that uh, eight out of 10 fatal crashes in our region occur on non-highway roadways, right? So, um, so, so people you know, on city streets and in neighborhoods exceeding even the posted speed by 10 miles an hour, um, for example, going from 35, going 35 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone um, really does have a very, very uh, uh, costly effect. Um, so starting next Tuesday uh, on August 24th, um, you'll begin to see billboards around our region, uh, bus ads and Spotify ads. We're also gonna be reaching out to your communication staff, asking them to post some social media uh, posts. The, um, the campaign itself will run through October 31st and, and we'll be working with your, your departments, as I mentioned, um, to really and hopefully get the word out. So anywhere you guys can help us in, um, in, in really shaping this message is such, such an important message for all of us in this region. Um, one fatality is too much and, and uh, we have way, way too many in this region. Bike to Work Day uh, is, is, uh, is scheduled for this year on September 22nd. You may recall last year, of course, like most everything, the, we, we canceled the 2020 annual event in June and we hosted a Bike Wherever Week last September, but thankfully we're returning to a, a live in-person event on September 22nd. Registration is now open and we're encouraging everyone to get give up their cars for the day and try biking. Um, as we've all always say, this is it's about changing behavior. 
And uh, there's, there's no better way of changing behavior than an event such as this, which is a friendly and safe environment in which for people to try, try, uh, try biking to work. We'll have the, the regular breakfast stations throughout the region, including Dr. Cog's Way to Go station at, at Civic Center Park. Um, each year we provide a uh, Bike to work Workday t-shirt uh, or hat for two interested board members to help promote the event. Um, it's easy to order yours even tonight by visiting um, and I'm hoping we can display something on the screen the a little later we, on. We oh, it's in, in the, the chat? chat? Okay, great. Um, and, and how to do that. But we'll, we'll be reaching out with you with some more information because we want to make sure um, they, they, that you get your t-shirt or hat. Last but not least, on affordable uh, housing front, um, House Bill 1271, the most recent legislative session, created three programs for, for the purpose of offering grant monies and other forms of state assistance to local governments to promote innovative solutions to the development of affordable housing across the state. And while the um, Department of Local Affairs is still working with stakeholders, including ourselves, Dr. Cog, um, is finalizing details on two of those grant programs. The third grant program is now open and accepting applications for local governments seeking state investment to assist in their efforts to complete housing needs assessment or develop policy and regulatory approaches that aim to reduce barriers to affordable housing. Um, so in the coming days, um, Dr. Cog will be sending out some additional information to the board and key local government staff. But I wanted to mention this to you this evening because the initial deadline is September 20th. It's my birthday, by the way, just a little plug there, just so you all know. Uh, <laughs> but if you do have any questions, please reach out to Brad Calvert and our staff and, and he'd be happy to assist you and your staff however we can. But look, but look out for that notice coming out here in the next week or so. And with that, Madam Chair, that's my report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Executive Director X. And that takes us to our public comment period. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment and each speaker will be given three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. I would request that there's no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board. And as soon as we're finished with public comment, we'll move on to our consent and action items. So we have at least one member in the queue uh, for public comment. If there are folks that would like to speak, please raise your hand by clicking the raise hand feature that you'll find at the bottom of the panel, or you can dial star nine if you've dialed in by phone and we'll be able to see a raised hand appear on your behalf. And so first up we have Marie Venner. Marie, please tell us what you'd like to tell us. Hi, um, I'm a former city planning commissioner, manager at CDOT and a lifelong Metro resident. Today, I'm also speaking from the Small Business Alliance and with the backing of a number of local and Metro consortia, including Unite North Metro Denver, Spirit of the Sun, Be the Change, Montbello Neighborhood Improvement Association, North Range, Concerned Citizens, Indivisible, local business leaders, Front Range Health Professionals, clergy, and many more. I'll submit a letter with the complete list. We are delivering this joint request to you tonight to reopen uh, um, your tips for 22, 2022 to 2025 to make it comply with the law to reduce pollution in Colorado 26% by 2025. We're counting on this. Our elected leaders promised Coloradans this when they passed and signed the law. Now it is time in past time for implementation. This cannot be put off until the next round of tips and stips. Putting changes off until mid-decade is unacceptable. And most of all, it will not produce the pollution reductions needed or and promised by 2025 or 2030. In the past decade, doctors have come to understand that it is not only strokes, heart attacks, asthma, and lung disease caused by this pollution. It is, there's every other sort of health impact as well. Organ failure, cancer, and mental, cognitive, and social effects as well. This pollution impairs our kids' ability to learn and is now known to cause 21% of Alzheimer's and dementia cases. Many doctors have concluded and published that there is no safe level of vehicle pollutants and US EPA safe levels definitely are not safe. Now is the time and chance to reorient and it's necessary and urgent to do so. We need you. 
plans must be reconsidered and investment paths altered or we will not get the results we need, just more of the same. For decades, we've seen transportation investments focused on highways, leaving 20 to 40% of people in each community who can't, shouldn't, or don't drive vastly underserved. Communities have, such communities have also borne the brunt of past CDOT involvement investments, whether it's dividing communities and taking businesses and residences or exposing underserved communities to the greatest amounts of pollution. Your own 2050 Metro Vision plan includes a good list of investments needed to recalibrate, about 3.2 billion in transit, bike, and pedestrian improvements. These should be a top priority of the statewide uh, plan and need to be in a reopen step and reprioritization of spending. We're depending on you. It's time to stop spending on widenings, which have been proven again and again to yield only more traffic and pollution on a one-to-one -one basis with the additional lane space after five years. We need to extend transit and make bus service free to the maximum extent possible. It's time to do right by the whole population, not just some, and to equalize the benefits after decades of investment in one direction. This can be done affordably. Building out protected bike lanes for the Did whole city costs have, as much. Sorry, really, last, sorry, I'm on the last sentence. Um, okay, thanks. If you could wrap uh, up, and if you have yeah, the comments cost, written, you're welcome as, to send them to us. Right, costs as much as one lane of a four lane highway. This needs to be done in the current step and other plans. Please require this today. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And um, Marie and any other people calling in, you're welcome to send us your written comments if you have prepared them as statements so that people can read them and contemplate them offline as well. You send them over to Dr. Cog's staff, which is drcog at drcog.com. Um, and any other members of the public care to comment this evening? All right, seeing them, that takes us back over to our action agenda tonight. Um, so first up, we have the consent agenda. Could I please get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Director Shaw? I move to adopt the consent agenda. Is there a second, Director Brackett? Second. Any discussion of the consent agenda from members? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. The consent agenda is approved. And so our first and only action item for the night is our discussion on the public engagement plan amendments. Lisa Hood, our public engagement planner and communications and marketing person is gonna take us through this. Hi, good evening, Lisa. Thank you, Chair Stolzman, and good evening, Board of Directors. I have, I have Elvin Vidal Sanchez with our transportation division is also here with me tonight. Um, we have just a few slides for you that I'm going to go through very briefly because they look very similar to what you saw at your June meeting when we had the public hearing for these amendments to the public engagement plan. But just as a quick refresher, I'm going to go through the changes. And for those of you who don't remember, back in 2019, we adopted the public engagement plan. And what that really is, is a guidebook for Dr. Cog's staff to plan and implement effective public engagement. It lists out our principles and goals and implementation strategies for the effective engagement. It also details evaluation of how we make sure that we are, are completing effective engagement um, on all of these regional decisions that are made at Dr. Cog. And so after two years of, of implementing that plan, there are a few amendments that staff is proposing at this time. So the first one is directly related to the last year and a half in a pandemic with only virtual public participation options. Um, while we had some inclusion already in the public engagement plan of language related to virtual engagement methods, we wanted to include a bit more based on what we've learned in the last year and a half. So things like virtual participation methods, always having an option for people to participate by phone, um, just some additional guidance there. We also added some direction on how to revise the public engagement plan and what would qualify as an administrative modification that wouldn't um, need to go through the full process of the committees and the board adoption. That would be things like typos and um, non-substantive changes versus a major amendment like the one you're seeing tonight. And similarly, we also are proposing specifying a process for different transportation or different amendments to the regional transportation plan. 
And that's something that was developed with a number of federal agencies during um, the regional transportation plan development. And so that's referenced in the public engagement plan as well, similar of having a minor change versus a major change in the process that follows, as well as just taking the opportunity to make some minor formatting and text changes to make the document as perfect as can be. So those are the proposed amendments. We did have a public comment period. You'll remember we had a public hearing at the June 16th meeting. We also posted the draft for public review and comment from late April through mid-June. We noticed the public hearing in uh, the April 29th Denver Post, and we promoted it several times through our social media website and e-blasts. The proposed motion before you tonight is to move to adopt a resolution adopting the amended public engagement plan. And Alvin and I are also here to take any questions you might have at this point. Thank you very much, Director Hood. And so that'll take us over to board members for question comments, or if someone would like to please um, make a motion so that we could frame the discussion, that would be helpful as well. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Chair. I will make a motion. Uh, to adopt uh, the resolution that uh, adopts the amended public engagement plan. Thank you. Is there a second? Director Peck? I second that motion. Thank you. Any discussion of the motion or questions or comments for uh, Lisa? Director Flynn, did you want to speak to the motion? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, Lisa if, or Alvin, if you could talk about where we see the uh, virtual participation growing, shrinking, where do we see that going and how valuable can that be moving forward in, in, in our various processes? Thanks, Director Flynn. That's a great question. I think that we've actually seen a lot of success with virtual engagement methods, especially in just the number of people that are participating in things compared to when we had in-person meetings. So you'll notice even at these board meetings, we definitely have more attendance from board directors and also the public. Um, when they are virtual because there is less um, travel that has to do uh, to come to the meetings and things like that. So there's a little bit of a lessened barrier in that respect. So I think that um, it can't replace in-person engagement. I think there's still some things that you just can't get virtually. So hopefully as the um, circumstances improve, we'll be able to interweave virtual engagement methods with the more traditional in-person methods that we've done in the past. But We've learned a lot about which methods work well or how to run a public meeting virtually successfully. So I think we'll take all of these lessons that we've learned and really integrate that in the future. Thank you. Uh, just as an observation at the Denver City Council, we have noted since we went to a hybrid virtual and in-person, uh, I would say most of our public commenters during public hearings have shifted to uh, the online platform and avoided being in person. And so I've I don't know if that's because of this year and the late summer and the surge in Delta variant uh, infections. We had one, as you might have seen in the news on city council, a member tested positive after our Monday meeting. Uh, but we've seen probably about 75% that at least of our public comment coming in online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Flynn. Any other comments on this agenda item this evening? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Aye
topics. Um, so all of it are most of the topics that Dr. Cog's staff has discussed with TAC. Um, however, we're only bringing four of those um, to you this evening, um, just because these four seem to be more policy oriented or on a higher level than the other uh, other topics that are included within your within your agenda. So certainly if you feel that there's additional topics that you would like to talk about um, and discuss that were included with your agenda, uh, feel free to bring that up here at the end of the presentation and we can have those discussions. Uh, but the four topics for this, uh, this evening, um, the first two involve the regional share. Um, then we'll talk a little bit, bit, little bit about the project scoring methods. Uh, and then finally, uh, possible ways to incorporate project readiness into the TIP process. Um, so what we are trying to do is to gather some of your comments and thoughts in real time. Um, for that, we are using menti.com. Um, so if you wish, uh, you could go to a web browser and, and at menti.com, enter the code that you see on your bottom left-hand side of your screen, or with your smartphone, you could scan this QR code. Um, so that will help us gather some input as we go along. And I'm sure I'll say this because um, I'm sure Director Rex would also say this, um, that the, the voting that we're looking for uh, this evening does not constitute any sort of um, action on your behalf. Um, we're just gonna use it as feedback to develop our policy. And if you haven't had time to enter that code into the website, uh, we will be showing that here in a couple slides. All right, the first topic is the regional share project funding. So our current, current policy states for the regional share that if you're going to submit an application, um, you must submit um, no more than a $20 million request in Dr. Cog allocated funds per submittal. Along with that, you also must fit, um, submit a 50% minimum match. So the recommendation from staff, which uh, TAC has weighed in on, would be to retain that $20 million request maximum per application but reduce that match down to uh, the minimum of 20%. Uh, at the same time, uh, staff is uh, interested in introducing a minimum funding request for any regional share application for $5 million. And the concept of introducing a minimum funding request for, a, for an application is simply to reflect the regional theme uh, in terms of what the regional share uh, really is meant to be. Um, I would note that also on the minimum funding request for $5 million um, at the TAC meeting in July, um, there was some comment from TAC members that they would like to bring um, a survey back to the TAC meeting that is coming up this coming Monday um, to see if that $5 million is still sufficient um, or if they would perhaps lower that just a bit. Uh, so certainly um, whatever our recommendation is with the TAC input, uh, we will make sure to include that within the draft policy document. So here's the first chance to uh, to, to garner some of your feedback uh, almost instantaneously. So the simple question is, is, do you generally agree or disagree with the staff recommendation for the regional share funding submittals? So this will include $5 million minimum, a $20 million maximum, and a 20% match. All right, give this another 15 seconds or so. And Todd, could you please repeat what the code is for people to enter to participate on the mentee? Um, yes, or, another, or another staff member? Uh, 3543 Director Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just wanted to make note here that it's difficult to answer uh, with uh, precision because it uh, violates the single subject rule. Uh, <laughs> a, you could agree with two and disagree with one. <laughs> so I just want to mention that. And then also just while we're on this slide, it looks like about 23 people have weighed in. I, if people have comments that they want to make ar around, you know, maybe there were questions like, does the federal government require a 50% match? Does the federal government require a 20% match? People may have had questions or comments. So if anybody would like to describe, you know, what drove them to the pool that they voted for, or just ask any questions, this would be a great time for that. Or say anything else. Director Odorizio. 
Thank you very much. Can you hear me, Ashley? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Sorry, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background. Um, I guess my concern is, my only question would be is, by putting in a minimum of $5 million, and I totally understand what the general intention is, but are we putting smaller communities at a disadvantage? I mean, is it, it, do we truly determine regionalism based on price, or is there some other rationale or criteria that wouldn't put smaller communities that might be regional in nature, but basing it only on, only on price? I would hate to put smaller communities at a disadvantage, because that's not how we define what, whether a project is regional or not based on the price tag. Thank you, Director Ogarisio. And um, I, I hope everyone has access to the chat. I haven't been reading what you've all been saying in the chat, um, but people are commenting there. And so I'm going to continue with that practice where I don't read the chat. So if you wanna say your comments out loud, go ahead and do that. Director Dyack. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my only question maybe is for Mr. Cottrell. Um, you know, I, Maybe he can sort of walk through how we get to regional uh, project submittals, because I think at the sub-regional, we have the ability to sort of promote projects up to the region. Um, you know, for me, I think, I think a minimum is interesting, and um, I'm supportive of it. Um, in, in the first iteration of the dual model, we were talking about transformative projects, and, um, you know, to me, I'm just trying to Get more information on what the what the process is that might be that might better frame the um, this this question Director Odorizio has. Right. Thank you, Director. Um, so the concept here is that um, applications are accepted from any applicant. However, uh, each subregion is is limited to a maximum of three submittals. Um, and then, of course, CEDA and RTD are limited to two each um, within the regional share. So based on what has happened last time, um, each subregion would get together and sort of discuss the, the up to three submittals that they would like to submit from their, from their subregion, um, uh, just considering everything else that is going on and all applications that are possible coming from each subregion. But again, it's limited to three applications. And just a follow up too. I mean, there were there were great conversations, at least within within the Douglas County subregion, on how we could uh, we could take care take care of smaller communities. Uh, that was a focus. Um, you know, to me, the uh, three submittals is restrictive um, uh, to the subregion. But uh, going through this once, um, you know, we got to a point where there were a couple of projects that, that were just glaringly regional and the other important smaller community projects um, were taken care of at the sub-regional level. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Dyack. And I have a question for staff on the, I, I, so we, we originally when we went into this, I think that there were some people that thought that it would be about 50% for regional and 50% for sub-regional. And we shifted a lot of the focus away from, from regional funding to sub-regional funding. I forget what the final split was, but I think it might be 80% to the sub-regions. And so I wonder if part of this is um, an administrative, did you recommend this for administrative ease? I mean, I, or I mean, what types of projects were submitted and what kind of drove staff to recommend this shift? No, uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Um, the basic concept here for the submittal of the $5 million minimum was simply to have each of the regional project submittals reflect the true nature of what a regional share project should be. Um, there was not any intent to say, well, this would limit smaller communities from submitting. Um, I, I think just based on the types of applications that we received last time, um, we were expecting, you know, more of those grandiose type regional share projects. Um, and again, just totally based on the funding amounts that were submitted, um, uh, you know, this is just that opportunity to see, to make sure that they are at a little higher level amount, again, hoping to reach um, the level of a regional share project. Thank you, Director Cottrell and Director Kelsey. Yeah, I guess um, as an interested observer, since um, Clear Creek County isn't part of the the 
area. Um, it would seem to me that the five million dollar minimum does make sense for the regional share. Um, I don't recall right offhand without scrolling ahead to see what the min if there's a minimum um, a minimum funding some uh, request for the sub regional um, request, but um, it would seem that that is probably where the smaller communities projects would fit better. Is that is am I on target or am I off? Yes. So, uh, Director Kelsey, the minimum um, amount for a sub-regional share project application would be $100,000. Thank you. And it looks like Director Rodericio has a question. Do you want to go ahead and ask the group so it can get answered, Director Rodericio? I, I put it in the, the chat more as a kind of a contemplation for us. You know, some of the questions that have come up is how do we define regionalism? And I guess my questions would be what factors do we use other than money? And it's to me, regionalism is connecting different uh, disparate communities, uh, various communities. Uh, what are we connecting? I mean, regionalism implies that we're connecting localities of some sort or connecting to amenities, or maybe we're addressing other issues that are regional in nature, uh, which could be improvements to the overall equity, uh, inequities that we're, we're trying to address in equity. So that's, those are the things that I'm questioning is it's more than just money is all I And I don't wanna put small communities or small projects at a disadvantage, that might actually be a big impact just because of dollars. Thank you very much, Director Rodriguez. Director Levy? Uh, yeah, thank you, um, Chair Stolzman. Uh, and uh, I appreciate Mayor Flynn's, or Director Flynn's observation that um, we've got a compound question. <laughs> so we're kind of stuck uh, with all yes and all, or all no. And I was yes on two out of the three. So, and I was kind of curious about, there was a TAC um, recommendation to lower the proposed 5 million minimum to two or 3 million, which um, staff didn't agree with. And I, I am kind of curious about that because I think um, regional projects, um, it, uh, it doesn't need to be defined by money. Yeah, that may be some indicator, but there, there are other criteria. So I would like to hear a little bit more from staff about why you, um, didn't follow the recommendation from the technical advisory committee on that. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Levy. So the $5 million minimum was suggested by staff, I believe a couple months ago. Um, and at the last TAC meeting in July, um, the TAC comments referenced the potential for lowering that amount, perhaps cutting it in half roughly. Um, and they asked for staff to bring back a survey at the August meeting, which will happen this coming Monday. Um, so at this time, the $5 million is still sort of holding as a staff recommendation, um, but we simply will have to wait until after TAC weighs in on some possible other options um, if they would like to see that $5 million amount lowered. So it's, it, we're not exactly disagreeing with, um, with TAC on this. We just haven't heard their full input as to what level they wish to, to, uh, to recommend. So uh, may I ask a, a follow-up then on that? Um, what, um, what's the significance of our vote here on this if you're still waiting to hear from TAC in that follow-up survey? I, I think the feedback that we're gonna hear here at this meeting gives us a general knowledge of the direction that we need to take back our recommendations on a staff level, level, but also the information that we can bring back to TAC to say, based on the comments that we're hearing, a minimum amount might not be appropriate in, in this manner. And just let me just add in that we're in the informational briefing section of our agenda, so we're not on an action item. So anytime we use the Mentimeter or anything like that, it's not a binding vote or meant to be a final decision, but just to be provocative for getting the discussion rolling. So people, these votes aren't final if you want to switch from agree to disagree or disagree to agree or anything in between. It's just to have good conversations so staff can understand where the board might be coming from and then bring back options that reflect the range of options that they heard from the board. 
Director Levy, I didn't mean to cut you off if you had more you wanted to add there. Director Flynn. I am, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I would like to see, and I hope other directors would like to see a, a data set that would tell us over the last several uh, rounds of the uh, TIP, uh, what were the regional projects? Uh, what were the dollar values in them? Uh, right now with uh, the dual, mo dual model, we have only $1 out of every five that goes to regional projects in the first place. So uh, when we're talking about setting a minimum of $5 million for something that's regional in nature, that gets only $1 out of every five to begin with, uh, I think it would be good to see uh, a breakdown of, uh, you know, would those projects be better suited for the sub-regional consideration, even between sub-regions, right? If it, if it were five, if it were less than $5 million. Uh, it, I feel like I'm sort of throwing darts in the dark uh, without having data on what were the, what projects have been funded prior to the dual model. Uh, read, of course, they were all regional in nature. Uh, that, that would uh, help uh, illuminate the darkness, and I'd see the dark board a little better. Uh, Todd, I don't know if you have any reaction to that. Um, I think that is something certainly we can bring Brett bring back to you the next time we um, d discuss the tip. Um, at the same time, that will be after our discussion on Monday uh, with the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, so we'll certainly have some conversations with them to to bring back a uh, a. a further refined recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Director Flynn. Director Binkley. Hey, everyone. Um, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> um, I, I had a question, Todd, when you said, it, I found it interesting when you said that um, the applications that you got the prior year, the reason you wanted to change this was because the applications you got the prior year were all smaller applications. So my wondering is why, if that's what communities seem to want, why, why are we trying to get different outcomes? Do you see what I'm saying? It, no, exactly. Um, I, I think a lot of the types of projects and the dollar amounts of, that they're going to be requesting is based on obviously the eligibility and the application questions. So to a certain degree, I agree, we're, we're sort of shooting in the dark here um, because it is certainly possible with whatever um, pol tip policy that we have for the regional share for, the, for this coming up cycle um, would be different enough to solicit, you know, potentially larger dollar amount projects. Um, but again, th this was a sort of a staff recommendation from the perspective of um, it's the regional share. Um, all of these submittals should be somewhat loftier than sub-regional projects, but not necessarily. And it does not necessarily mean that a sub-regional project is any less important than a regional project. Thank you, Director Cottrell. Director Binkley, did you have any follow-up? Uh, no, I mean, um, thank you for all that information. I'm not sure it really answered my question, which was why Why do we actually want those bigger projects? And, and you may have a valid reason, and I just don't know why. And it looks like um, Director Pastor has his hand up, so he may, I, I think it's been up for a little while, so he may have an answer or some more information on that and then some additional information for other folks as well. So let's turn to him and then we'll come back to you, Director Binkley, to see if that answered your question more fully. Yeah, thank you, Chair Stolzman and um, directors. Um, you know, I, I think this has been really good feedback. We, we definitely are, we heard some feedback at the end of the last tip cycle in our sort of review and our survey that there was, there were questions about the definition of a regional project for the regional share, keeping in mind that the regional share is 20% of the resources available to allocate through the TIP process. To, to uh, Director Odoricio's point, a setting a minimum on the pro, on the application size on the on the grant request size is a proxy for trying to get at sort of a regional scale project with without 
definitively defining or boxing in our local government members about kind of trying to define a regional a regional project because that gets very tricky. But we did we did have we did hear some concern about some of the applications for the regional share last cycle that maybe they weren't regional projects. So this is an attempt. So what I've heard, I think what Todd's heard is some some level of discomfort on setting a minimum uh, request size for the regional share and uh, a, a desire on the on members of the board's part to ask us to put some pen to paper to, to, to better define a regional project. So we will attempt to do that. And my last point is I think the one of the governors around this is sort of that limit of three three requests per subregion for regional share. I think that will that will bring up um, in the process sort of the best regional projects um, in the view of the of the subregion. So just wanted to put some context around that. Thank you, Director Papsdorf. And Director Binkley, back to you if you had any other follow-up. No, I see where y'all are coming from. It just um it just seems like if that's what the communities are asking for, that we should also believe that communities know what they want. I mean, it seems a little bit incestuous, like I'm not sure which way this goes. Is it what the communities want or what, you know, we're doing with the money? Um, but I it probably won't get an answer to that. But um, it's just a little bit frustrating being from a small community. And I know we hardly ever use this money or apply for it because it doesn't really work for us because of all these different types of, of things. But um, thank you. Thank you for Thank you. Director Cockrell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I may have misunderstood you, but it sounded like we could change our, our mentee vote, but I'm unable to do that. Based on the discussion, I would want to change what I initially voted. Thank you. Yeah, so I was, uh, I don't think this poll is still open at, on my side either. So I just more meant that this isn't a binding vote. And so, and we could actually probably ask Steph to go back and refresh and revote if we wanted to. Um, but I think it has served the purpose of getting a really good discussion where we were able to give our feedback to staff. And I think it's been heard very clearly by them what, what direction we would want to see some changes. Absolutely. Sure. Thank you. Chair, I lost this Jim Dale lost my picture, but I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Jim. Um, what I think I heard was that we need a definition of what a regional effort is. And I always thought it was a thing that went across two subregions, but I think the definition is the key thing. And then if we understand the definitions, then we understand what Director Flynn talked about it of past examples, then yeah. th this would make the process better for those people in the out years that would be doing it, which won't include me, but I think it's really important to get the definition straight. So I'll Thanks, Director Dale. That. And I don't wanna cut off discussion. I see there's still several hands, so we'll take the hands that are up now, but I will just say, I think the staff has heard from us and when we see this again, they'll bring back some other options for us to contemplate. So um, if we, I'll let Director Shaw have the last word on this topic and then we'll continue in the presentation because it looks like there'll be more things for us to vote on and have opinions on. Director Thank Shaw. Thank you. I appreciate it, Madam Chair. I think that in addition to uh, just the tax recommendation, um, it would be helpful to have even a list of some of the projects in the maybe the last two cycles and kind of give, give a descriptive name and the, the amount that was requested. I think that helps us understand what at least past uh, votes had determined to be regionally transformative, which is I think the definition that we had gone with in the past. Uh, and, and so it really, we do still want this this type of project be differentiated between you know from the subregional projects, but um, maybe the examples will will uh, help everyone understand the the scope and um, 
the desire to be transformative. Thank you. Thank you, Director Shaw. All right, Todd, take us to the next topic. All right. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for your comments. Uh, so we are now going to move into uh, keeping on the regional share, but moving into project eligibility. So the current policy is based on the 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. And I just wanted to start with some high level, uh, sort of a high level overview of the staff recommendations. Uh, so first, um, the concept of our recommendations are to update the eligibility from MetroVision and the 2040 RTP to align to the recently adopted 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan um, and those regionally funded fiscally constrained project and program investment categories that were outlined within the adopted plan. Um, the second high level recommendation is that we're looking to only adjust the eligibility of the region, regionally significant projects. So again, a definition for a regionally significant project is um, a BRT or a roadway lane mile change of a mile or greater. Um, for interchanges, this would include either a new or an added movement. Um, now, this RTP did something slightly different than what it has done in the past. Um, previously, only regionally significant projects for air quality. So otherwise known as those capacity or capital projects. Those were the only projects that were considered as part of the fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. Within the 2050, um, there was the introduction of um, more regional projects, but not necessarily regionally significant for air quality. So there is a distinction. Um, regionally significant for air quality has a legal definition versus just an, R an RTP project that is identified that is regionally important for the region. Um, so our, our, our sort of our, our other concept of, of making this recommendation was to focus on the current priorities for all of those RTP identified projects, whether or not it was a regionally significant project for air quality, otherwise known as those capacity or capital projects, or whether it was a project that was identified in the RTP under a certain staging period that was still important to the region, but didn't rise to that yet capital or you know, regionally significant level for air quality. Um, the focus um, for our recommendation is basically contained within the first two air quality staging periods. So the first two um, are the 2020 to 2029, and the second 2030 to 2039. And essentially what this our recommendation is, recommendation is saying is if you have a project that is contained within the 20 to 29 air quality staging period, you would be eligible for any project phase of that project. So essentially pre-construction through construction. However, if you were in that later 30 to 39 air quality staging period, you would be eligible only for pre-construction activities. Um, so staff in the last couple of slides here laid out sort of maybe what that would look like in terms of eligibility. Um, on the far left-hand side contains the um, RTP category. So if you notice, the first two lines are the capital projects and the BRT projects, um, and it goes in line with what I just said. Um, if, you are, if you have a project listed in the RTP in that first 20 to 29 staging period, you would be eligible to submit any project phase um, within the regional share eligibility. However, if your project was listed in the 2030 to 39 stage, uh, you would be eligible only to submit that project for pre-construction activities, meaning anything up to construction. Um, if we continue down the list and look at corridor transit planning projects and programs, or if we look at arterial safety, region vision zero projects and programs, um, we have the same sort of um, division where if you have a project that is listed in the RTP in one of those two staging periods, you would be eligible for either the construction of the entire project or in that later phase, just eligible for those pre-construction phases. But at the same time, there's also other projects that might not be listed in the RTP. Those other projects would also be listed. So for example, if we're looking at a transit corridor, um, perhaps a regional mobility hub, 
would be a, a type of project that would fit into that category and would be eligible. Um, if we're looking at an arterial safety project, um, you could also submit a safety project that would be located on the high injury network um, that is contained within the Regional Vision Zero plan. Um, the last two categories include active transportation and freight projects and, and uh, program. So again, same notion as before, if your project is listed in the RTP, according to which staging period, that would tell you um, which phase of your project would be eligible, eligible, eligible to submit. So any project phase or just the pre-construction activities, but you also would be eligible for other projects that would not be listed um, within the RTP. So for an active transportation project, um, any active transportation project that would close a gap or extend a facility on one of the identified active transportation corridors, or if you're looking for a freight project, um, as long as it were listed on a tier one or tier two of the regional highway freight vision network. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what staff was recommending for the regional share eligibility. And we have another question and poll. Um, do you generally agree or disagree with the recommendation for the regional share project eligibility? Madam Chair, can I get a question in while we're waiting? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I tried to watch hands and then of course I clicked back on the agenda and I lost my hand raised function. Okay, Director Brockett. No worries at all, thank you. Um, one qu question for you, Todd. Uh, there were several types of projects that could not be submitted if they were a, um, an air quality significant, I forget the exact language, but a significant with respect to air quality uh, calculations. Can you explain why that is, please? Um, it, it is essentially comes down to being able to keep the regional transportation plan fiscally constrained. Um, so there is an abundant number of projects in the region that uh, you know we would like to be able to complete. However, we have to complete those within the budgets we have. And there are budgets uh, constrained within um, the three, air quality staging periods. Um, so it really all depends on um, if those projects, um, if they were accepted and adopted into the regional transportation plan, which staging period they would fall into um, and the amount of funds that we have available for each of those staging periods. So trying to keep us within our sort of overall budgets for what we can expect to be able to spend? Correct. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you. All right. Great feedback, everybody. You want to keep going, Todd? Certainly. All right. So now we can move on to uh, project scoring. Um, so if you recall in the previous tip round for 20 to 23, um, if you are a scorer or even contained within the application, um, each application could be scored, each question within the application scored. Um, was looked at with a score of a high, medium, or low for each of those questions. Then, as if you were a, a, a person who scored those applications on a scoring sheet, uh, those were translated into a three, two, or one. So three for a high or one point for a low. Um, our recommendation, in which a majority of TAC did agree, um, would be simply to eliminate the high, medium, and low reference. And this is simply because when we were talking about the actual score of a project, um, that information was converted to that three, two, or one at that time. Um, as a slight update to the recommendation, staff would be interested in looking at converting that three to one to a five to one scale with a five being high and a one being low. Um, this would simply give us additional um, you know, space between each of the projects um, that are scored. So hopefully there's a, there's a better distinction between the projects that are, that are um, all submitted. There we go. Um, and next on to the question, do you generally agree or disagree 
with the recommendation for the project scoring, which would be to eliminate any reference of a high, medium, low and convert that to a five to one scale. Todd, I prefer a negative two to two if you're asking for other feedback. All right, any other questions or comments? Director Dale. Well, my perception of one, two, three, or one through five is is happy to glad, and uh, I guess you're looking for more discernment. But uh, it, it's kind of like trying to vote in that last question with uh, what Todd talked about. If I had enough spreadsheets, I might have understood it better. But anyhow, it's Mox next to me. Director Dale, I lost you a little bit at the end. Um, sorry about that. It wasn't, I said, it, I did, it didn't make a big difference to me. I just, I just see some scale changes are not too meaningful to me, but that's all right. Thanks, Director Dale. Director Maurer? Um, I was just curious. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I was just curious if you could say why from the TAC that 15% were unsure. Did they have some questions or could you shed some light on that? There was no comments that were made verbally or in any sort of chat that I can recall. Um, they also took a mentor meter poll and I, I believe what they were responding to was uh, agree, disagree, or an unsure. Okay. Thank you. Director Kerber. Yeah, I just want to say, and I think it's fine to go to five, four, three, two, one. But I think we should all recognize that what we're trying to do is take subjective evaluations and put a number by them. And it may make us feel better, but they're still subjective evaluations. So again, I agree that it should be five, four, three, two, one, but I don't think we should be too confident that, that if it's 4.34, versus 4.15, that, that one is better than another. Uh, again, the methodology is fine, but, but let's not just get too comfortable with, our, with a mathematical conclusion of all this and think that we've made the right decision. Well said, Director Kerber, thank you for that. Director Dyack? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, just to create context, I mean, the uh, three-point scale, it was a little bit of a, of a challenge, obviously, the. Uh, the scoring is um, something to frame the sub-regional discussions, um, you know, but the, um, it was just a challenge at times to directors, Director Kerber's point to, um, to see if a, if a 2.1 was truly better than a 2.05. So um, it started the conversation at the sub-regional level, uh, and then we went through it to, to truly select the projects that were impactful to the interests of Metro Vision. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Todd, what else do you have for us? All right, so we have the subject of project readiness. Uh, so Dr. Cog defines project readiness as you know, the status of your project that ensures it's ready for development and implementation. Um, and this is, happens all pre-application. So essentially is whatever the staff of your agency is doing um, to gather all the details, to put your application together, to make sure that if it is funded, um, it is all set ready to go. It is in budget as much as possible. It can be delivered on time as much as possible. Um, any roadblocks or potential roadblocks that you might see when you're filling out the application, those sort of things can be handled, dealt with. There's been, you know, there, conversations can be held before funding is awarded. Um, so within our current policy, we don't necessarily directly incorporate any of this information. Um, now we, we might imply a little bit here and there, um, but this was one of those areas within our application that we have really been lacking. Um, so overall, the staff recommendation uh, is threefold in which a, a great majority of those TAC members present when we had this discussion agreed, is that first of all, uh, we would, 
require a CDOT supplied um, cost estimate form. Um, and this would allow every applicant to make sure they're using the same form, filling out all of the same information um, because as you know, one agency might have their own cost estimate form while you know, agency B might have something else. Um, we decided to use CDOT throughout the region because they're most familiar um, with not only the state funded projects, but also the federally funded projects and hopefully would have um, the most information put together on their cost estimates that everyone could use. So the best way to look at this is if there is an error within their cost estimate form, at least everyone would be making it. Now, hopefully that would never be the case, um, but on the positive side, um, we're hoping to bring every single application sort of up to speed and up to the same standard for at least cost estimation. Um, the second rec recommendation would be to um, add additional background information into the non-scoring part of the application. Um, a lot of the information that we collect now, um, for example, might relate to the phases of the projects um, that you're looking to include within your project. There are certainly some questions that we can ask um, to get applicants thinking that may be beneficial in the long run to making sure that they're going to, again, stay on schedule. Have you thought about this little element? Um, you know, if you've gone through your right-of-way assessment to really think about all of the costs that might be associated with your project. Uh, and finally, the third recommendation would be to add a brand new scoring section um, that would have a weight of approximately five to 10%. Um, the exact weight, again, we can sort of figure that out once we have more of the application and more of the tip policy items put together. Uh, and hopefully within uh, two to three months, we can start seeing that throughout the committees, including the board. Um, so we did survey the TAC members present and ask them questions, you know, please rank these 10 um, in order of project readiness and how you would think um, if these sort of items and questions were contained within your application, how much of an impact would that have on project, project readiness? Um, so the first came in as, you know, the status of what are the impacts to the utilities, or maybe right away, railroad, historical resources, all of those things that um, sometimes don't necessarily get the most attention, um, but are very important to keeping your costs and your schedule in mind. Um, so just a couple other items that were included was, you know, perhaps if your application is for a single project phase, um, that would be a little easier to manage and um, more of a, a status symbol of having your project ready to go, or is your project contained within an approved CIP, um, or have you been, has this project, um, you know, have you been through the IGA process before with the project, and then the additional funding that you're asking, it can just be added for, you know, along with an option letter. So different things, um, to, again, to, you um, have applicants think about how ready their project is. Um, so again, staff is developing that and hopefully when we bring the draft application back, um, that, that scoring section will be part of the draft application for everyone to review and comment on. Um, so final question, uh, do you generally agree or disagree with the recommendation to enhance project readiness um, by simply adding the cost estimate and this new scoring section. Director Cottrell, while, while folks are scoring that, I have a question for you or maybe some information you could bring back next time. Um, the Dr. Cog Board, we've spent a lot of time around the boardroom table when we used to be around a table talking about um, delays, project delays and what causes them because if you're delaying, you're tying up money and another project could be going and we all know pro projects cost more the longer you delay. So. Did you um, kind of use the information that we've gotten over time from the reasons that projects are delayed to develop what types of things we wanna check for and readiness? And can you kind of show us that when you bring it back that like if right of way acquisition is always the reason that people delay projects, maybe we should require people have acquired their right of way before they submit a project. I mean, I'm just, that's a, I have no idea if that's the right one. Well, but you're hundred percent correct. I mean, that's, that's one of the leading indicators of where the current issues are with projects. Now, 
project readiness gets at more what can you or what can you do or what should you have done before you submitted that application. But at the same time, with taking the information that we receive um, back on a, a, a on every six month basis with project delays, that does give us some insight into what should could have happened um, before the applications were submitted. So yes, that is a very good leading indicator uh, of putting this section together. And then just my other comment, and then I, I apologize for taking time from the group, but um, if we could, if we do go this route and have additional project readiness kind of criteria or check boxes that are sort of go, no go criteria, could we back that up? And then, so let's say project submission is due January of 2025 and we know it'll take somebody a year to get those things in project readiness done. Can we send all of our communities out a thing that says, if you're thinking of submitting in January, make sure you go through your project readiness checklist. This will get you ready for your January submission. These are the types of things that you're going to be scored on. Just to remind all the communities to get ready for the submission. Yes, that would be, that would actually be something that we could actually do relatively um, soon, um, sometime this fall. Uh, you know, assuming that we stay on schedule and the regional share or call for projects would open up um, in late January. Um, so certainly getting the information out to sponsors ahead of time. Again, anything that Dr. Cog staff can do um, to enhance the submittals, which in theory would enhance the projects that are being funded to keeping them more on budget, on time, which is only a benefit to the entire region. Thanks, Director Control. Director Brockett. Yeah, so thanks for this. Just a, a quick comment. Um, the uh, standardized cost readiness uh, form sounds like a great idea so that people are were able to compare apples to apples a little bit better. I just offer a caution on the scoring section that I think it's fine to take uh, relative res readiness somewhat into account, but I would keep it on the, the small number of percents because Sometimes the projects, the difference between the scoring of the projects is very small for who gets funded and who doesn't. And I'd hate to lose a great project because it was deemed to be like slightly less ready than another project, but would still probably get done on schedule. So, you know, I wouldn't want to see this ranked up at the same level as, you know, compliance with Metro Vision goals, for example. So I'd, I'd recommend a really a, a very small percentage for this one. Thanks. Thank you, Director Brockett. Director Mauer. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea to have a standardized cost estimate form because, yeah, things can go different. You know, people look at things differently. Um, but I'm just curious, can you help me with the project readiness chart? Now, are, is that all 10 of those categories? Are they equal or is it just going to check it off and you, you get, you know, what? If you got 50% of them, it's okay, or yeah, kind of kind of help me through that, would you? Right, right. No, so the survey results from the TAC input simply give staff an idea of the level of importance. So for example, if we go to number 10, where it says project manager, federal aid um, has project experience. So, you know, does your staff member working on the project have federal aid experience? Per the survey, um, TAC members felt that that probably wasn't the highest consideration. Um, so this, the weighting of this just gave us an idea of what may be the most important things to look at versus things that are not as important overall uh, in terms of looking at project readiness. So you would, what I'm thinking is, is you're gonna look at maybe these 10 categories or these 10 bars you have here. And uh, it, they're equally, maybe. You're not gonna weigh them separately for each one of these. Just yeah. remember, what I think I heard Todd say is he's gonna come back to us with more formal. This was just to get a sense of the types okay. of things and then he'll come back with something more refined after. Okay, all right, thank you. Sure thing, anybody else? All right, D Director Cottrell, take us home, wrap it up. I I'm all set. Uh, that was the last of the four categories that uh, we had planned to discuss this evening. And as I said at the beginning of the presentation, there was, I think, 14 items that were included within the agenda packet on the memo. Um, certainly willing to talk about any of those. 
uh, if anyone would like to have a conversation. Um, other than that, happy to take any comments or questions from, from the memo or anything from the presentation that you heard this evening. Any other comments or questions from members on this agenda topic? And welcome, Director Olson. We see that you joined us. Thank you so much, and we'll make sure we mark you here in the attendance. All right, seeing no other comments on this one, we'll, we'll go to our next informational briefing, which is an update on the greenhouse gas transportation planning rulemaking. If you're following in your packet, it's attachment D. And actually there was a, um, it was sent out as a, um, a, a addendum because we got it, um, you know, late, late night Friday. So look in that addendum and uh, Director Papsdorf, our Director of Transportation Planning and Operations will take us through this tonight. Thank you, Chair Stolzman, um, members of the board, Ron Papsdorf, uh, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations. Um, we had a conversation about the um, CDOT statewide greenhouse gas emissions rulemaking related to transportation planning at your uh, board work session meeting just a couple of weeks ago. So we're following up on that. Um, I have, I, I apologize that we, but we did send out the, um, the proposed rule as, as it was issued Friday evening. We sent that out Monday to the board. So you have that and some additional info, information that CDOT filed with that rule filing um, Friday evening. Um, so you, you do have that. Um, I, I will refer to some of that. I, I apologize. We did not get a presentation into the packet when the packet went out last week, obviously, because the rule hadn't been filed. We've been scrambling to do a review of the, of the rule as it, were, as, as it was proposed. With your permission, I would like to just pop up a quick presentation just to guide our conversation. I think it'll be a little bit easier than scrolling through the 31 pages of the proposed rule and help focus the conversation. So if that's okay, I'd like to do that. Thank, thank you, please do. And Director Pastor, could you just kind of frame for people, you know, where we are in Dr. Cog decision-making process to what tonight is for and then what the coming meetings will be about. Absolutely, we'll do that. Okay. Um, Director Dyack, I can see you on my screen. Can you give me a thumbs up? They so can see the presentation. Thank you. All right. Okay, so I do have this. So um, I do have some goals for this evening. Um, hopefully, I'll achieve at least some of them. Uh, kind of review again the rulemaking schedule and the process for the rulemaking. Walk you through the structure of the of the rule. Talk about some of the the main key provisions of the rule um, as it's proposed. Um, and uh, walk through a, a, a set of preliminary questions that sort of Dr. Cox staff has generated as we've as we've reviewed the proposed rule over the last couple of days, and even sort of leading up to the filing of the proposed rules through our conversations with other stakeholders and with CDOT leading up to the filing of the proposed rule. And really the, the, big, the big goal for tonight is to sort of set the stage for further board discussion and direction on, on responding to the rule as it's proposed. This is not the last conversation. This is sort of the first conversation around the proposed rule. And I'll talk about sort of next steps, but we anticipate this occurring over a couple of board meetings um, uh, before before uh, we ask the board for any um, direction to staff or position on the rule. That's what I'd like to do to this evening. Um, just by way of reminder where we are in the process, um, the, the Transportation Commission authorized CDOT staff to initiate the rulemaking back on July 15th. Uh, they had intended to and did uh, file the, the formal notice of rulemaking last Friday, um, August 13th. I'm, I'm not superstitious, but I will note that that was Friday the 13th. Um, that, that notice kicks off a 60-day written comment period. One difference here is that when CDOT filed the notice of rulemaking, since it was in the evening of, um, uh, of the 13th, they did add an additional three days to that written comment period. So now that written comment period will end October 15th instead of October 12th, just in recognition that sort of the filing happened in the evening of Friday and sort of accounting for the weekend. So giving everyone a couple of extra days. Very much appreciated. Um, there will be a series of rulemaking hearings beginning uh, September 14th um, uh, uh, next month. And then the plan is for, and I'll talk about that. It's a, it's a series of eight um, hearings, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then November 18th is sort of the right now anticipated schedule for the commission to actually uh, consider 
the rule for adoption. If they if they stick to that schedule, then the rule would become effective on January 14th. So that's kind of where we are in the process. Um, and I will move on quickly because there's a lot to cover here. So just quickly by way of background, we covered this a couple of weeks ago. So one of the pieces of background is, is our own MetroVision plan that does include objectives to improve air quality and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And as, as a matter of fact, sets a performance measure and a target to decrease surface transportation related greenhouse gas emissions per capita in the region, 60% from 2010 baseline levels by 2040. Um, in 2019, um, the legislature adopted House Bill 1261, setting out some targets to reduce greenhouse gas pollution statewide from all sectors, uh, including transportation. Um, the state issued um, early earlier this year, the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Reduction Roadmap to set out a pathway to meeting those targets uh, in House Bill 1261. And then this year, Senate Bill 21260 um, adopted new requirements for CDOT guidelines procedures for both CDOT and um, MPOs around the state related to transportation planning and projects uh, to help achieve those House Bill 1261 reduction targets. The rule components, so the rule as um, uh, proposed and issued on Friday, amends existing rule, um, uh, rules governing statewide transportation planning process and transportation planning regions around the state. So that's existing rules. So they're using that rule uh, to um, amend in the greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction pieces related to transportation planning. It includes some new preamble language, doesn't have the force of rule, but does put sort of the proposal in some in some context to the preamble. Uh, it includes new definitions um, around the rule. It has some new a new provision around statewide transportation plan uh, in section 4.06. That basically just adds a new require, requirement for CDOT for the statewide transportation plan uh, to include an analysis of how the statewide plan um, is aligned with Colorado's climate goals and helps to reduce, prevent, and mitigate greenhouse gas pollution. And then it adds the, the state's 10-year plan as an appendix to the statewide transportation plan. And then there's a, a new provision in amendments to regional transportation plans and statewide transportation plan, basically just adds a provision that CDOT's process for considering amendments to the 10-year plan are carried out by CDOT in coordination with MPOs and the rural TPRs around the state. So those are all kind of early provisions. The real meat of the proposed rule uh, comes in the form of a new section eight in the rule um, around the greenhouse gas emission requirements. And so I'm gonna I'll go through each of these sections, but 8.01 establishes um, the uh, transportation planning reduction levels uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, point zero two is the process for how you determine compliance with the rule. Uh, point zero three uh, I, talks about greenhouse gas uh, mitigation measures. Point zero four is about uh, consultation with the Air Pollution Control Division, APCD, um, and their confirmation and verification of the process. Point zero 0.05 is an enforcement provision, and then there's some reporting provision in point zero 0.06. That's that's affects CDOT and every five years having to report out on progress. So that's the overall structure of the rule. I want to get into a few things. Um, so on the definition side, section one, um, if you've had a chance to look at the proposal, you'll, you'll see a whole bunch of red lines striking out. Uh, that's because there's 46 existing definitions in, in the existing rule that's being amended. And then this rule is proposing 19 new definitions. Um, I think instead of trying to go through a cumbersome process of renumbering, uh, the proposed rule basically strikes all the existing definitions, adds the 19, and sort of reorders them all in alphabetical order. So it's just easier to easier to structure. So really there's there's 19 new definitions being added. I've picked out four here that are that are pretty important for us to consider as we think through the rule. Um, uh, so I'm not I'm not going to go through all 19 of the new definitions. I'll focus on these four. So the first really important one is the applicable planning documents. So these are these are the plans that are actually subject to the rule. So for us as an MPO, um, it, it, uh, uh, it refers to the fiscally constrained RTP. So our 2050 RTP is our current fiscally constrained plan and TIPS 
in MPOs that are not attainment areas. So for North Front Range uh, MPO and Dr. Cog MPO, um, our TIPS would be subject to this rule. The other three MPOs that are not non-attainment areas, uh, their TIPS would not be subject to the rule. Uh, CDOT's 10-year plan and their four-year prioritized plan, that, that four-year component of the 10-year plan are also subject uh, to the rule in the non-MPO areas of the state. And the, it, it talks about the non-MPO areas of the state because their 10-year plans really have to be incorporated into our regional transportation plans at, at the MPO level. Uh, the baseline uh, speaks to the, gosh, sorry, sorry, I got a pop up on my computer. Um, let me get rid of that, thank you. Okay, so the baseline definition speaks to the estimates of greenhouse gas emissions for each of the MPOs and for the non-MPO part of the state. Um, and those are prepared using our travel models um, or the statewide travel model. Um, and then the estimates must include the greenhouse gas emissions resulting from the existing transportation network and implementation of whatever the most recent uh, regional transportation plan is in the MPOs and the 10 year plan in the non MPO parts of the state. The greenhouse gas reduction level is the amount of greenhouse gas emissions expressed in carbon dioxide equivalency reduced from the projected baseline uh, that we have to attain through our transportation planning activities through those applicable planning documents. And then finally, the mitigation measures, those are non-regionally significant project strategies implemented by CDOT and MPOs that reduce transportation greenhouse gas pollution and help meet the greenhouse gas reduction levels. I think this is, I'll, I'll give you just a little preview of, of some of the questions and the issues that we're struggling with is um, what, what this rule sort of speaks to around mitigation measures a lot of them are really things that we just include in our plan. They're things we plan to do. We're investing in bike and pet infrastructure, in TDM services. Like those are all incorporated into our plans and our, and our tips. And so uh, that's that's one of the issues we're going to be uh, looking at pretty carefully. Moving on, this is table one from the rule. This is the greenhouse gas reduction levels. I want you to look at all the numbers, but again, each of the five MPOs um, on the left and then the non-MPO part of the state uh, have baselines for each year, 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050, and then a reduction level in million metric tons annually of carbon dioxide equivalent um, emissions. Um, so that's important. So for instance, for Dr. Cog, for 2025, the baseline projection is 14.9 million metric tons per year of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, our reduction target would be 0.27 or 270,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide from that baseline. So those are the targets. And then the compliance section point, um, section 8.02 speaks to um, how we demonstrate compliance. So when we adopt or amend an applicable planning document, and again, for us, for Dr. Cog, that's, that's our tip. Uh, adopting the TIP or uh, a regional transportation plan or amending the regional transportation plan, we conduct a greenhouse gas emissions analysis. We have to include the existing transportation network and any regionally significant projects that are in the, that are in the plan or the TIP. We estimate the total emissions for each year in table one, and then we have to reach agreement between the MPO, CDOT, uh, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment on, on our modeling assessments, which I th would think is a really good idea. We have to, we, we come together, we coordinate, we consult with each other, we agree on what those model assumptions are as we're uh, for that analysis. It's very similar to what we do uh, with the state and with the Environmental Protection Agency and Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, when we're doing federal air quality conformity, that consultation is really important and helpful. Um, and I will note here that compliance in this, in, in this realm does not apply to our TIP amendments. So the rule would apply when we adopt a new four-year TIP, but it would not apply to TIP amendments uh, between TIP cycles. The second part of compliance is that um, CDOT will establish by April 1st of next year um, an ongoing process for selecting, measuring, confirming, and verifying those mitigation measures because uh, there's just examples in the rule. So this would formalize that and uh, would be a process to actually get into more details around those. Um, CDOT and MPOs can incorporate those uh, 
mitigation measures into our plans to help uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and achieve the reduction levels. Um, that uh, process would also determine the relative impacts of mitigation measures, um, measuring and prioritizing uh, impacts of the mitigation measures, particularly on communities and disproportionately impacted communities. And then finally, um, sort of the credit that would be awarded to specific solutions uh, to consider in the aggregate and the community impacts. So uh, a process that's laid out in the rule, but is um, not defined yet, this uh, subject to sort of an, a, a process that would happen after the rule is adopted. And then the last piece um, of compliance relates to sort of the time frame. So uh, we've had conversations here at the board around Senate Bill 260 in the past. It set out an October 1st deadline for next year for CDOT to update its 10 year plan and for Dr. Cog and North Front Range MPO to update their RTPs to meet the greenhouse gas reduction levels laid out in the rule. So that, that, that Senate Bill 260 provision is being incorporated into the rule. And then after October 1st of 22, for each applicable planning document, we likewise would have to go through that analysis process and demonstrate uh, compliance with the corresponding greenhouse gas reduction levels. Um, at least 30 days prior to adopting a plan or a tip subject to the rule, uh, we would have to, we would provide to the Transportation Commission a greenhouse gas transportation report. What's in a greenhouse tra gas transportation report? Well, it's the analysis demonstrating compliance with the levels in, in table one in the rule, or for Dr. Cog, um, as an MPO in a non-attainment area that receives, um, uh, receives sub-allocated uh, congestion mitigation air quality funds and SDBG funds, um, we would demonstrate that we're utilizing our CMAC funds and SDBG funds only on projects or approved mitigation measures that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And CDOT would be utilizing the 10-year plan funds anticipated to be expended on regionally significant projects in the MPO only on projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So there's part of the enforcement here. If you can't demonstrate compliance, then your greenhouse gas transportation report has to show that you're only spending those funds, those CMAT funds, SDBG funds, and the 10-year plan funds on projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions or on mitigation measures. Um, and then we would that report would also include a mitigation action plan that identifies greenhouse gas mitigation measures needed to meet the reduction levels. Every year after that, um, on April 1st, um, we would have to provide a status report to the Transportation Commission documenting um, all of the greenhouse gas uh, mitigation measures included in the plan, included in that transportation report, uh, again, for each greenhouse gas mitigation measure. So uh, the timeline, the current status, quantification of the benefit or impact, any delays, cancellations, or substitutions for each greenhouse gas mitigation measure. So again, just want to flag that that's important to keep in mind later on. Um, again, uh, section 8.03 uh, addresses the mitigation measures more specifically. Um, this section allows CDOT and the MPOs to utilize approved greenhouse gas mitigation measures to offset emissions and demonstrate progress towards compliance of those reduction levels. Um, here's the rule includes some examples. I've listed them here. I'm not going to go through them all, but they, again, Many of these are things that, as I mentioned, we incorporate into our plan. They're, they're part of the plan structure. We plan to make investments in uh, bike and ped access. Um, we plan to invest in first and final mile access. We plan to make investments in transit services and so forth. We plan to make investments in TDM practices. Those things are incorporated in our plans. The rule calls them mitigation measures, and we're trying to kind of navigate how do we account for the fact that they're in our plan make sure we're getting proper credit for them in a plan versus sort of mitigation measures above and beyond what we're already planning on doing. Um, the section 8.04 is the um, uh, confirmation and verification by the Air, Air Pollution Control Division. Again, at least 45 days prior to adopting a plan, we have to provide to APCD for review and verification the technical data contained in that uh, greenhouse gas transportation report. And then um, the last section I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover for you tonight is the enforcement provision. This is section 8.05. So enforcement looks like the Transportation Commission reviewing 
that greenhouse gas transportation report that we have to submit at least 30 days prior to adopting a plan. And the commission determines whether the reduction targets in the rule have been met and the sufficiency of any greenhouse gas mitigation measures uh, that are included um, if an MPO or CDOT has to, has to use them to demonstrate achievement of the targets laid out in the rule in table one. If the commission determines that the requirements have not been met, then the commission restricts the use of, for Dr. Cog as an MPO in a non tainment area, our CMAC funds, our SDBG funds, and CDOT 10 year plan funds that are anticipated to be expended on regionally significant projects in the MPO area on projects and approved greenhouse gas mitigation measures that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's that's the enforcement piece. If, you, if you're not if you're not demonstrating compliance, um, then the commission restricts the use of those federal sub-allocated funds and CDOT's 10-year plan funds in the MPO area. Um, there is a provision that an MPO, CDOT, or a non-MPO transportation planning region, the rural TPRs around the state, can request a waiver or ask for reconsideration. Um, the waiver request um, for a specific project not expected to reduce greenhouse gas emissions can only be can only be granted on the following basis that the trans the greenhouse gas transportation report reflected significant effort and priority placed in total on projects and greenhouse gas mitigation measures that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and in no case uh, will a waiver be granted if the waiver would result in a substantial increase in greenhouse gas emissions when compared to the required reduction levels in the rule. So fairly limited, but there is an opportunity for a waiver for specific projects um, that might not otherwise be able to proceed. Um, again, if the commission determines that the reduction targets have not been met. So here's some initial questions. I will say, like we're we're trying to wrap our brains around this rule, um, acknowledging fully that CDOT has been pretty transparent. We've had a lot of opportunities to talk to talk to CDOT and other stakeholders leading up to the rule, uh, but there's still once we see the rule in its final form now and start to see the whole thing together, we do have some questions um, and that we kind of want to lay out there and get you to think about and um, as we continue our conversation. So one piece is in the, in the context of TIPS and the fact that the rule would apply to TIPS in for Dr. Cog and, and North Front Range MPO, which are near term, how can we analyze those against the greenhouse gas reduction level horizon years? So again, so think of it in terms of the next TIP cycle we're, we're just about to enter, which will cover the fiscal years 24 through 27 well, the, the horizon years for the greenhouse gas rule are for 25, for 30, for 40, and 50. And so we have, we have questions about how we analyze sort of a four-year set of investments in the TIP against those horizon years um, in the context of this rule. Um, should the greenhouse gas reduction levels apply to TIPs? Uh, TIPs for MPOs, uh, TIP investments have to be consistent with a plan, with the regional transportation plan. We can't we can't include projects in a TIP that are not included in the regional transportation plan or aren't consistent with the regional transportation plan. So if the plan is complying with the rule, by extension, does the TIP comply with the rule and with the time frame, does that create some difficulty? So that's something that we're thinking, thinking through. Will or should the baselines change over time? Will they be reevaluated based on MPO modeling? Right, the, the, love, the reduction levels in the rule now were developed using CDOT's statewide plan, looking at the statewide model. And full acknowledgement that the statewide model is very much based on Dr. Cog's model and incorporates the regional models from the MPOs and, and a lot of our assumptions. But it's still a statewide model and, and there can be some differences between the regional models um, applied by the MPOs. And so we have questions about sort of how the baseline changes or should it change um, and should we use the regional model to set the baselines in each of the regions versus using the statewide model. Um, again, I mentioned this, many of what the rule calls those greenhouse gas mitigation measures are planned investments in the Dr. Cog RTP already. Um, and should the required analysis provide an opportunity to assess sort of the total emissions for all those investments without calling them in mitigation measures. And, and the key for that is that if we call all of those things mitigation measures under this rule, 
um, those those planned bike, pedestrian, other non recently significant projects, uh, greenhouse gas mitigation measures, then that subjects them to annual reporting. And there's a lot of them in our plan. Um, and um, I think that 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 you know is that appropriate sort of in the context of 30 year plan. Would that be an onerous kind of process for reporting? I think we have to think through um, how that would how that would work in a region our size, and especially in the context of a long range plan that has a lot of those things already incorporated in it. Um, this is my last. This is um, the last page of questions. Just so you have a you have a you have a sense of where we are. Um, uh, I think we staff has some questions about you know whether there are some elements of the rule that are inconsistent with um, federal law and federal federal regulations that around um, metropolitan planning, um, regional metropolitan uh, planning, transportation planning. Um, we have there are some very specific requirements um, and parameters around metropolitan transportation planning that MPOs are subject to. There's nine federally mandated considerations that we have to take account take into account in our in our transportation planning process under federal law and regulation, not just sort of environmental. And they're there, you know, we we're required to take all of those things into into account. Um, and um, along with several other specific federal requirements um, for regional transportation plans and how we demonstrate compliance with sort of federal performance measures. Um, can or should the rule limit uh, limit or restrict the use of federal transportation funds? Uh, the rule the rule says um, all of the surface transportation block grant funds that get sub allocated to an MPO would be restricted under this under this rule. Is that appropriate? Is that right? Um, the federal government, when they're when they're appropriating um, and apportioning federal funds, has specific performance measures um, that states and MPOs have to comply with, and they have restrictions on federal funds if a state or a region isn't meeting those requirements and can put some restrictions on certain of those funds. Um, CDOT sort of facing one of those issues around uh, statewide safety performance measure, and so there are some restrictions of a portion of um, the funds that get allocated. Another example is um, the state is sanctioned because the state doesn't have a hard enough um, DUI, a repeat DUI offender sort of restriction in state statute. And so the federal government takes a portion of uh, a portion of federal funds related to that federal requirement and instructs CDOT to use that for a specific purpose. In this case, this is the state adopting a mandate and trying to restrict the use of federal funds. And I think the, the question just that we all have to ask is, is that appropriate? Should it apply to all federal funds? How do we, how do we accommodate that? Um, is, uh, I have a, we have a question about whether CDOT is allowed to seek a waiver for a 10-year plan project in an MPO area. The language isn't quite clear to us um, and what implications that has. If CDOT is asking for a waiver from its transportation commission, um, how does that impact a waiver that the MPO might want to request um, in, under the rule? And then finally, um, does the rule require MPOs to get a waiver for transportation from the Transportation Commission to invest federal funds on non-regionally significant projects, think safety projects, operational projects, reconstruction projects, multimodal corridor planning things, TDM activities, things that we fund out of our TIP that, um, that, are, already, that are already planned, if, if we're not complying, uh, if we're not conforming with the reduction targets, would we have to seek waiver from the Transportation Commission to use funds on these types of non-regionally significant projects? It's not quite clear to us yet. So uh, that with all of that, I'm sorry that it took a long time, but it's a, it's a long rule. Um, this again, as I mentioned, first conversation, not last conversation. We're certainly not asking uh, the board to take any position on the rule um, or give any staff direction at this point. Um, we do anticipate bringing this back to the September 1 board work session to continue reviewing, talk about maybe in more detail around some of those, those initial questions we have and any questions you have tonight, um, and then anticipate we might come back on September 15th to the regular board meeting for direction to staff and or comments on the rule that you may wish to submit during the written comment period, which ends um, October 15th. 
Um, again, that written comment period started on August 30th and extends till October 15th. And then there will be a series of at least eight Transportation Commission rulemaking hearings between September 14th and October 4th, two of them in the metro area on the 23rd of September at Swansea Recreation Center in Denver, and on the 27th of September in the South Suburban Sports Complex in Littleton. So lots of opportunities people can attend all eight or any of the eight of those um, public hearings. With that, just to sign off on my part, I think, you know, any feedback this evening from the board about any additional questions you have, um, any additional information you might want from us uh, to help your deliberations and conversations at the next meeting. And then if you have any, if you have any thoughts about maybe how you'd like us to structure and approach the discussion um, at, the, at the board work session, just to, to make this easier to digest for you and, and to get meaningful uh, dialogue and feedback. So with that, I am happy to end and turn it back to the chair. Thank you, Director Papsdorf. And if you could put the slide up with the schedule for us. So um, we don't have to exhaust all of our questions tonight. And I just, that's why I wanna put the schedule slide up. So like uh, Director Baker put in the chat, um, could we see projects evaluated using uh, the greenhouse gas reduction tools to see how they would be affected if the rules were in place. So the current list of projects. And, and there's a lot of questions people have like that of things and information that would be helpful to see to have a better discussion. So as you think of those types of things, if you send them over to Ron and the staff, then you know it's a tight turnaround with the rule altogether. Um, but they'll see what which things we can provide for the work session to enhance the conversation. So go ahead and email those as you think of them to staff. And if people have questions that they want to bring up or discussion points they want to bring up tonight, that's great too. But I just don't want people to think they have to have thought of everything tonight. And I, uh, before I turn it over for questions and comments from members, just want to extend a great deal of thanks to Ron and the rest of the staff for the tight turnaround on this, um, getting the rule late at night on Friday, and then and doing this analysis and really working through it for us for today. So we can all start thinking about it is really awesome. And I really appreciate all the extra hours and work that went into that and wanna thank you. And I'm, I'm sure the rest of the board wants to thank you as well. Other questions or comments from members on this tonight? I know it's a big topic and we're just digging in. Director Brockett. Yeah, um, Ron, thanks so much for that analysis. I, you know, I read through the rule in the last couple of days and it's complicated and you, uh, you really boiled it down very well. And I look forward to the next uh, phases of analysis. So thanks very much for that. But one, one question that, that occurs to me is, Dr. Cog, of course, is uh, world famous for its modeling, right? Y'all are super high-end professionals when it comes to modeling. Uh, but do we currently in, in have in the Dr. Cog models, you know, how a particular project will affect greenhouse gas emissions? Or is that something that you're gonna to need to build from scratch? Um, Madam Chair, Director Brockett, so um, our transportation model does not estimate um, air pollutants, um, emissions of, of any sort. It, it estimates travel behavior and travel demand. Those outputs and, and characteristics of sort of travel on the transportation system, those outputs are then place, put into a federally developed model called MOVES, which is an emissions model. And that model takes output from the travel model and then estimates uh, various pollutant emissions. And it's, it's, used, it's used for federal air quality conformity determinations. That's, a, that's um, Environmental Protection Agency developed sort of, of model. And there have been, and there have been very various um, iterations of that model. The current, the current MOVES model is MOVES 3, for instance, and there are uh, updates to those. Um, I, I, I do want to note very specifically, though, that um, you know, our model models a system. It's, it's a system of projects. It's, a, it's the transportation network, and it's, and, it's the, and it's the travel demand on that system and travel behavior that's estimated based on land use and employment and job locations and individual travel choices. It's, it's very complex. We do not model individual projects individually. We, we include a system of, of improvements 
and we modeled a system um, and, and the travel behaviors as a result of the use of that entire system because um, we've done a lot of work and it, particularly in a system our size, but truly uh, in, in practically any transportation system, any individual project, um, the impacts on sort of a regional scale are can can be fairly can be fairly modest and and for some projects kind of can can fall within the margin of error of, of any any models output so it's really important for everyone to understand we look at a system of improvements um, and uh, the models and the tools are not capable of 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 estimating the impacts of really any any one single project uh, very effectively or very accurately and it's not the projects that create emissions it's the travel behavior of people using using the system that that create emissions thanks for that answer ron i guess um i'd be interested as we move forward with this about hearing more about how the modeling for this will work because and I think that'll be critical to this piece. Like if, if someone wants to do a, a mitigation project and they say, well, we're gonna add three miles of bus rapid transit to our community, I would hope that would have a you know significant impact, but how you model the addition of that BRT is gonna be critical. So I'd love to learn more about how that'll work out as we uh, discuss this through the next few weeks. Thanks. Thanks, Director Brockett, Director Bidham. Director Vidov, I'm not hearing you just yet. Testing, testing, testing. There we go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the impetus uh, for this conversation is House Bill 1261. And the ultimate achievement of that is by uh, 2050 to have a 90% reduction of greenhouse gases. Okay, so currently in the United States, the cons we consume 3,900 terawatts of electricity per year. 61% of that electricity is created by burning uh, hydrocarbon fuels. So obviously, uh, some change would have to take place to reach the, the 2050 goal. But just for a moment, let's set that aside. The Department of Energy says the average electric vehicle in the United States travels 13,500 miles per year, and it consumes 4,000 kilowatt uh, hours of electricity per year. So by 2050, if one half of the electric, of the vehicles in the United States were electric, totally discounting increase of population, that would require 6,242 thousand additional terawatts of electricity beyond anything that we're producing right now. So where is that electricity going to come from? Obviously, burning hydrocarbon fuels is, is off, the, um, off the discussion board. So you could uh, solve that problem with a substantial investment in nuclear energy. But generally, people that want to drive on an electric car are politically opposed to nuclear energy. So let's say we, we want to create that uh, additional electricity from solar panels. Well, here's the facts on that. Uh, one square mile of photovoltaic panels produces 3, 000, uh, 375 megawatts of electricity per year. So therefore, if you're gonna provide the, that uh, electricity for the 143 million cars in the United States, which would be electric, that would require 528,000 square miles of pho photovoltaic cells. So to put that in context, that's about twice the land area of the state of Texas. Okay, so I don't think the rule structure, you know, of forming the rule structure is necessarily the uh, problem. I think the problem is uh, if you want to go to uh, the 2050 goal, where is the energy going to come from and how is it going to be created? Thank you for uh, hearing my comments. 
Thank you, Director Bedham. And I think it would be fun to do a Mentimeter on the nuclear energy question. I think you might be surprised. Director Levy. I have to get my mouse on the right screen. Um, I realize that we're gonna have a lot of time to talk about this in the future. And so I, I also just wanna understand a little bit better um, how models will be used and what they're capable of doing. Um, I'm not, and I did read the rule as I read it, but maybe I misunderstood this. Um, each uh, MPO could potentially have a, a, its own model using its own methodology. And it, what is the provision for in getting consistency there and making sure that you know we're all doing apples to apples. Um, uh, just and then again, you know, along the lines of modeling and what it's capable of doing, Ron, uh, as I understood what you were saying, that you know we model transportation behavior across a whole system, and um, but projects get scored based on the project, which is just some discrete uh, you know, aspect of the system. And it may be a very isolated project that, uh, you know, I, I don't, could you just explain how modeling can apply to the way the TIP is developed and approved when, um, you know, it may be, you know, a segment of highway, it may be an interchange, it may be a, a length of bikeway where, you know, it's not a whole system. And uh, I'm, I'm having a little trouble understanding how this is gonna work. It's, I, don't count me as a skeptic, I, I'm all in um, trying to have the emissions from our transportation sector reduced. Um, in fact, I'd go farther than this in terms of goals, but I really don't understand how how we can model these things. Yep, um, thank you, Director Levy. Um, so <clears throat> it's been a it's been a really long time ago in my career that I did travel demand modeling. Uh, back when I started out, way longer than I care to admit, because you all will know just how old I am. Um, <laughs> but and and we do have some really terrific staff um, at Dr. Cog that are that are really good at modeling. And we we do have a very sophisticated travel model, um, and, and appreciate folks acknowledging that. Um, and we'll, we'll bring them back and kind of talk a little bit more in specifics about that. But to your point, um, you're right. What, so first of all, I want to put it in context. We always consider air quality and, 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 and air pollution impacts sort of as we're screening and, and making decisions about specific projects to fund through the TIP. And it's certainly a top of mind when we were developing the 2050 RTP and putting together a, a set of investment priorities um, over the next 30 years in this region to help address those issues, which is why we included bill, uh, over a billion dollars in um, plans to ex in, implement and, and build out a regional bus rapid transit network um, around the region. So those, those, those considerations are really important inputs and, and influencers to those decisions when we develop the 2050 RTP. And even when, and there are, they are definitely considerations when selecting projects, when you all select projects to fund with the Dr. Cog directed uh, funds through the, through the four-year transportation improvement program. Now, can we do better at how we do that? Certainly, and I think you will, we will have conversations with you um, as we develop the TIP policy for the next TIP cycle about how to um, even better and improve on how we how we take those things into consideration and making and making decisions. Um, but for modeling, there's just we, we're staff doesn't believe that there's any value or that our models are are are, are the proper tool to try to estimate specific greenhouse gas emissions from specific projects. So when we adopt a new tip, we use those screens to select projects. Once the projects have been selected in draft form, then we model all of those projects together on the system to estimate system-wide um, emissions for our federal air quality conformity. And that would be sort of the process we would use for demonstrating compliance with these rules. 
So I, I hope that helps. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I'm not sure my question was very clear, but I, I think what you're saying is you wouldn't score a project based on greenhouse gas emissions from some specific project. You're gonna look at the effect of that project system-wide. Um, I think we're we're concerned about the appropriateness or the ability to use our travel demand model. So 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 just to play this out a little bit, we get, I don't know, Todd will Todd will correct me tomorrow or or later on this evening. Say we get we get 50, 50 applications for tip funding in the next tip cycle, and so. Uh, one approach would be to try to, okay, we've got the existing network, the existing transportation system, we put in one of those projects, and then we rerun the model to try to determine what the impact of that, that single project was. We take that project out of the model, we put the next project in, we run the model again, we get results from, for, for that project, um, and we do that for all 50 projects, right? Um, so the first issue is, the model, when we're looking at a large regional system that is trying to estimate sort of the travel behavior of millions of people that live in the region and doing their daily, going through their daily lives, that there's just not enough, there's not enough impact of any one project for most of those projects to really sort of influence the outcome on a regional scale. And we're trying to demonstrate compliance with a regional, with a regional outcome. The second part is running the model takes a good day or so. So you you'd have just you'd have a couple of months just running the model. Um, and so there just there are just some real logistical and mechanical issues with that. Now, what we are looking into and in investigating is are there some sort of sketch things that sort of go between guessing, go kind of improve upon sort of guessing or thinking about what what air quality impacts might be of a particular project um, and sort of and modeling using the regional travel model to estimate um, kind of impacts of, of one project. Is there something sort of in the middle at a sketch level that can help inform all of us uh, better about sort of considering potential impacts of those decisions in the in those in the investment decision? Um, and that's that's one of the things that we're we're going to be looking at. Thanks, Director Papstorf. I think modeling is certainly a section that you'll want to tell us more about at the work session, the, the impacts of the modeling, for sure. Uh, Director Kerber. Yes, thank you. And I'm going to step up to about 50,000 feet and, and probably uh, be harsh here. But, you know, I, I've been at this for about 20 years and trying to reduce greenhouse gases and reduce uh, uh, you know, pollution and, and you know, I, I know that all of us, all of us are responsible and, and, and decent people that want to do the best for our constituents to have clean air and less greenhouse gases. And, and uh, but we've got to the point where we are so far in the weeds that I, I don't think we're seeing the trees or, or any particular tree. Uh, you know, we've been working on public transit, first mile, last mile, ped, bike, all that kind of stuff and presuming that if we just have more of that, it will solve our problems. And it doesn't. It, it just doesn't. Uh, Director Vidim had a good point. Uh, we have all these, these points and we go like, we're creating more demand for electricity and we're creating more demand for pollution. And what I would suggest is, you know, I know that Dr. Cog has, has had a policy for density. They want to have more density in the metro area. But the truth of the matter is, is that with more density comes more pollution. And you can have transit-oriented development, and you can have bike and, and public transit, and you can have uh, pedestrian. But of those 100 people that are in that transit-oriented development thing, they're only going to use those, uh, those alternate methods, maybe 50%. I don't know. I'm just making up the number. They're not going to use 100%. So as, as we champion increased density, we are championing increased pollution. And, and it struck me the last time we had this meeting when, when Commissioner Teal, uh, uh, Director Teal said, well, you know, Castle Rock should get some, some credit for these TIP projects because they're having uh, development out in Castle Rock so the people out there can drive a short amount of time and, and go to work there. 
uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Moby, uh, Director Moby said the same thing. They're having open space. So they're taking land that's out of, uh, that could be developed, that could have more people, that could have more pollution, and they're having open space and shouldn't they get something? What I would suggest is that for all of you, and don't have to respond now, but just think about this. The problem we have is we have too many people bringing too much pollution to this metropolitan area. We have policies that uh, encourage people coming to this area and bringing their pollution. And we should talk about policies that disperse the population. You know, like folks in Lyman, they need jobs. Uh, folks in Lock Bowie, folks in Sterling, uh, all those places throughout the area that could use development. Uh, the Denver metropolitan area in the Front Range is encouraging development, it's encouraging pollution, and we are never gonna reach our greenhouse gas goals. We're just never gonna do it because we have the wrong basic policies of encouraging development, encouraging density. And Ron, you're doing a great job trying to like, like monitor your way through all this, but more bike trails, more pedestrian, more public transportation is just not gonna do it. Uh, and again, I'm uh, kicking this off, but I'd like everybody to think to themselves when they turn off this Zoom call and, and, and the dark things, are we really doing the right thing? We're up against the mountains and we have a geological formation where ozone packs up against the mountains and causes uh, uh, air quality problems. And we just may have too many people. And I'd like all of you to think of the concept, how many people are enough in a metropolitan area? When are we too full? Uh, and when are the more people that come here causing harm to the people we have now? So on that happy note, thank you very much. Thanks, Director Kerber, and um, I appreciate your candid comments and the idea that we could step back and, and look at this holistically too. So I appreciate the robust dialogue and everybody being confident to weigh in. Director Wheelock? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree that concentrating people means that you concentrate houses and you concentrate cars and you concentrate stores and you concentrate all those things and you, so you therefore concentrate the, the, the molecules of their emissions and, uh, and their breath and everything into one local place. But you don't solve global, I mean, global warming, I'm gonna say it that way, AGW anthropogenic global warming, isn't something that you solve for your city. It's something that you solve for a planet and that's what greenhouse gases is about. It's not about, how much greenhouse gas we have concentrated where we are, it's about what's all around us. So I have to say that, that, that density does reduce overall greenhouse gases by generally reducing the amount of transportation that's required. Um, I agree and I've, uh, I have an issue with uh, uh, relying too much on electric, electric coal powered vehicles too. But it is a fact that the, electric, that the energy generation industry is doing a better job than transportation of converting to lower emitting uh, uh, forms, like it or not. The problem is we have a lot of population. I, I chose passive solar design over active solar uh, about 40 years ago when I studied it and got my degree in it because I recognized that the technological supply side solutions tend to be used as additive rather than replacement for other things because our human nature is to want to have more and I think that actually, therefore, Director Vidim just gave a, a great, great reason for these greenhouse gas goals um, and for actually demand side management and why we need all the tools on deck. Um, you know, honestly, transportation has changed little uh, other than by little percentage increases here and there uh, from that that my uh, grandfather used to haul the hay to the barn about a hundred years ago. You know, it's a bunch of, uh, other than some prettier cars and some nicer paints and some better upholstery and stuff like that, it's, you know, the vast majority of them are individual people with their own sex symbol driving around on the highway with a bunch of internal combustion uh, driven, you know, pieces of metal slapping around inside a metal case and continuing to pollute the exact same way we've done it for a hundred years. Transportation has been the slowest sector to change. And that's what we're here trying to talk about, I think tonight. 
Um, and that's why it's so important that we, that we do apply the goals of greenhouse gases, or you're right, the mountain is so big that we will never solve it, but it's not because density doesn't work or multimodal doesn't work or reducing your miles doesn't work or concentrating more people into vehicles that are more efficient doesn't work. It's because we're too goddamn selfish. Pardon me, I know we're not supposed to use that language here. We use a lot of decorum in this organization and because each of us wants to keep doing the same old thing and we believe that we can solve our pollution problem by moving away from pollution out somewhere else and driving a long ways to get there the same way we always did. And so we have to make these compromises. And I believe that therefore multimodality in all of its forms is critical because we need every tool in the bag. I think that aggressive budgets that are scaled to the actual size of the problem on a global scale are critical because we need every tool in the bag. We need incentives and enforcement because we know that human nature is, I want to take my Volkswagen GTI out on the highway and hit 131 miles an hour, you know, because it's fun, because that's what we like to do. And finally, we know that land use and planning and multi-use and density and the right kinds of density and bringing people together and creating lifestyles in which they don't need to all have their own sex symbol running down the pavement is important too, like it or not. So I disagree with, with the comments that just came before me. And I think that they've uh, honestly completely mischaracterized the problem. My lifestyle can remain great for within my lifetime and I can have all the things I want and I can move out somewhere and I can drive a whole lot and it's all gonna be nice for me and then I'm gonna die and somebody else is gonna be left with the baggage that I left behind in the atmosphere that we're leaving all the time right now. So that's my take. Thanks Director Wheelock and, and thank you to everybody for the robust discussion. I think this um, shows that you know, if we have a bigger discussion and a broader discussion, we'll be able to come together with some collaboration and hopefully move the ball forward and come up with a path forward. Because what I've heard from everybody is that there's an issue and we need to address the issue and defining the problem and understanding the magnitude and what levers there are is going to be important. So the um, key, I think Director Levy put it in the chat pretty well, is that we're going to need to have agreement on what's factual and what's not and understand, you know, where we are and where we need to be. So if you have questions um, that we can send to staff before the work session to help establish, you know, what the facts are. I think that'll be really helpful. Um, and we can have different discussion around what tools can and can't work. And um, we can look at the modeling and understand what the limits of the model are. We can look at where we are today and understand the limits of the knowledge that we have. But the way we get that information and that good discussion is for you all to send your questions to staff so they can prepare something for us to understand and learn from, and then we can have a good discussion at the work session and then hopefully take a position at next month's board meeting. Director Seitz. You're muted. Director Seitz, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the conversation. Um, and for this really um, amazing uh, analysis on such a short time period, um, just going back to asking questions, I'm just going to start out my question with the premise that um, I, I do think that we have, um, it's important to, to do a, a greenhouse gas rulemaking. I do think the transportation sector um, is the, the largest uh, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in Colorado right now. And so I do think it's an appropriate conversation. Um, but I also recognize there might be limitations to our model on discrete um, project by project basis. And so I would like to get um, for the board work session some recommendations from staffs as to alternatives from our traditional modeling um, that might allow us to understand the impacts. Um, because this is the system we have, right? This is how we've been looking at projects. This is how we do our 10 year plan. And so it, it's understandable that there is a desire for us to make sure um, we're incorporating um, greenhouse gas emission reduction into what we approve and to where dollars go. And so um, if this is cumbersome, what are some alternatives that we could look at um, so that we're, we're, meeting, um, we're meeting 1261, right? We're doing no less than, than what, is what um, 1261 um, targeted for. 
Um, and are there alternatives we see or is that too confusing? So I apologize not being a transportation model or I don't know um, the discrete impacts or how difficult they are to tabulate, but I'd like to have a little bit more information on there on those. Um, and so th that would be helpful for me um, is I guess to understand the, the implications, but I, I definitely um, appreciate the conversation, think this is important and meaningful and, and do want to see a way for us to meaningfully lower greenhouse gas emissions in the spirit and in line with 1261. All right, well, thank you everybody. And so go ahead and send those questions in in the interim and um, Dr. Cogstaff, I can't commit that they'll be able to answer every single question because I think we all probably have pretty complicated questions, but I know they'll give it a good shot for the work session. And it looks like Director Papsdorf will wrap this one up for us and then we'll go to the next topic. Sorry, Chair Stoltzman, I did, I did, um, Director Seitz's comment sort of, I just wanted, I just wanted to be clear with, with the board that I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to, if I, if I did, I didn't mean to imply that the rule um, would require us to do a project by project analysis. That's that's not our read of the rule. That's not how the rule is structured. Um, it's structured to to kind of approach it like we do our federal air quality conformity. We look at it as the system. So I didn't mean to imply that the rule would require us to do that. I was trying to speak to the challenges of why we think that's not a good idea or how that how that's difficult. Um, but to your to your question, director, I very much appreciate. We will we we have been thinking about and we will continue to think about we'll bring that forward to board about sort of some options, as I as I mentioned earlier about how we might be able to sort of improve um, our considerations um, of of air quality impacts and greenhouse gas emissions to inform selection funding funding decisions in the context of all the things we really need to consider um, uh, in, in those transportation decisions. Thank you, Director Papstorf. All right, Director Ricks, please tell us briefly about the board collaboration survey. Briefly being the operative word there, Madam Chair, I believe. Um, no, thank you all very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Great discussion tonight. And I think it speaks to the collaborative that we do have to take on these big heady items. Um, I will tell you that um, the Performance and Engagement Committee um, asked that I'm that I bring this topic to the board as a formal agenda item, just to have a conversation with you all. It's about the collaboration assessment. And I certainly welcome um, the performance and engagement chairs, um, Steve Conklin's comments, uh, uh, if, if he has any um, at, at the end of this. But uh, I just wanted to quickly um, explain to you exactly what this is. Many of you guys know, I've, I've been here for like eight years now, but I was in Oklahoma City for a long period of time before that, and Kansas City before that. And, my whole professional career has been in um, with councils of governments. And there were, you know, when I worked at the other places, there were places around the country where, you know, this collaborate, their, their collaboration process was more mature, let's say, than in other places, particularly in some of the places that I had been. And so we were always aware of, of what was going on in those communities, right? And Denver was one of those. And it was always known. Maybe it's because we're the third oldest council of governments in the country or whatever that reason is that, you know, this collaborative spirit has always existed. And when I came here, I was pleasantly surprised that that just wasn't smoke and mirrors, right? That there truly was some very careful dialogue and conversations that occurred. Well, back in 2015, um, when Jerry Stiegel, uh, before he retired, uh, well, many years before he retired, he introduced this idea to Jennifer Schaffel, my, my predecessor, about um, uh, creating this collaborative assessment to an assessment of the collaboration that we have at Dr. Cog, right? And um, so every year since 2015, we've done a, we've implemented a survey instrument and um, uh, that is scheduled to go out tomorrow, by the way, uh, uh, for, for, uh, for your, for your um, for you guys to fill out. And I so, so we want to take it just a few minutes and just run through exactly what that is. Now it's a long survey. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and tell you it's not. Um, and that's part of the conversation that performance and engagement committee had. There's 13 sections to this survey. And um, so so please keep that in mind. But we have made a couple changes this year. One, we were more accurate with how long the survey would take you to complete. Um, it used to be 15 minutes on there, and we all know it took a lot more than 15 minutes. But the most important part of it is that you can now, um, you can start the survey, stop it, and then come back to it. 
So that within, after you complete each individual section, you can stop, save it, and then come back at a future date. Um, you know, and the other thing I wanted to point out with this survey is that, um, you know, it, it truly does have value. The Performance Engagement Committee um, uses this survey to look at where we are in our, in our collaborative. It's all about continuous improvement, of course. And um, so for, I'll give you an example. The, the Performance and Engagement Committee and the Finance and Budget Committee were formed as a direct result of the conversations that occurred through the assessment and and this and the and the stuff that led up to to the to the creation of the assesses the assessment, um, there was a, an expressed desire for 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 committee members to become more actively involved in certain aspects of of, of the agency. Um, before before we had those two committees, we just had one administrative committee, which was you know made up of twenty members or whatever. Um, and I think there were those that felt kind of left out of the process. So we created the opportunity for more, more board members to, to get involved in it. So I, again, I, I know we're short on time, so I, I really won't uh, belabor the point, but I would encourage everybody, this is your kind of first salvo to, to complete the survey. Um, to new members, I don't want you to feel uncomfortable in parts of the survey that you might not be able to address, right? Just answer what you believe that, that, that you can answer. Um, there's no pressure in, in, in filling out all this, all this, uh, the, um, the answers. If you don't know, you don't know. And that's, that input is as good as any other, quite frankly. It's probably better than, than, than some that we understand that there are aspects of the job and work that we do that you're just not up to speed enough on and maybe we need to do a better job of, uh, of getting, getting folks up to speed. Anyway, I'll leave that there. I see uh, Director Conklin has his microphone turned on. So, uh, Mr. Conklin, go ahead. Just very briefly, because I think you covered it really, really well. Uh, the reason the committee wanted it to be an agenda item is just to be sure everybody knows how important this is and know that your opinion matters. Uh, whether you've been on the board a day or if you've been on the board for 10 years, uh, all of those opinions matter. So we can't encourage you enough to take the time. Uh, it does take a little bit, but, but please, please, please uh, spend some time and, and take the, the assessment because it is helpful to the organization. So thank you. Thank you, Director Conklin. Any questions on this topic? All right, so I think I heard Doug say the survey will go out tomorrow. That's and correct. so just as a friendly um, reminder up front, if you don't wanna get a reminder to fill it out, fill it out within the first few days that you get it. Otherwise you'll start getting reminders. Thanks everybody. And so that takes us to our committee reports. And if committee members can give some brief um, updates tonight, that would be great. So from the stack, we had no action items this month, but the Glenwood Canyon crews have really been working quite hard. Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Starker. Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, caucus met on August the 4th with a focus on affordable housing and homelessness. Uh, we had a uh, housing development blueprint uh, report from Peter Lafari and uh, Evelyn Kim with the Common Sense Institute. Uh, Dr. Jamie Rice with the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative talked about landlord recruitment, the uh, Flex Fund, and Bill to Zero updates. Uh, we had a, a discussion and a, fee and a download from Liz Peets with the Colorado Realtors Association about the uh, uh, condominium market response to the 2017 reforms. And Andrew uh, Paredes with the, uh, the Director of Housing and Finance at the Colorado Division of Housing talked about maximum impact of new dollars uh, coming into the market. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Starker. Director Baker, anything from the Metro Area County Commissioners this month? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. We met on Friday, the 23rd of July in the Dr. Cog offices. So thank you to Director Rex. And um, we had presentations um, led by, of course, our chair this year is Adams County Commissioner Eva Henry. We did have a presentation from our stack representative and the Dr. Cog board chair, Ashley Stolzman, uh, concerning Senate Bill 260 and 267, uh, specifically year 3B funding allocation. We did uh, have a conversation on transportation rulemaking with um, CDOT's Rebecca White, Teresa Takushi, Andy Carcian, and of course, 
Doug Rex and Ron Apsdorf. We are still evaluating two different logos for the Mac group. And our next meeting will, we're gonna cancel the August meeting. We'll be meeting at the Adams County Governmental Center on the 17th of September. Thank you, that concludes my report. Thank you. From the Advisory Committee on Aging, do we have a report from Director Sanchez Warren? Uh, you do, and we did not meet in July, so that's my report. Thank you. And Regional Air Quality uh, Council, Director. You're on mute. Mm, golly, sorry. Uh, I Thank you, Madam Chair. I will mention one item because it did take up the majority of time at the RAC meeting. Uh, we had a presentation from from um, the uh, executive director, Mike Silverstein, about the employee traffic reduction program withdrawal from, from the department, the rulemaking associated with. Um, and ultimately the, the, um, the uh, RAC board decided to send a letter as part of public comment um, to reaffirm its support to the, uh, of the mandatory ETRP program and to request that the AQCC move forward with a rulemaking hearing as previously planned. Um, they also uh, suggested in the, in the letter that uh, RAC supports the voluntary commuter trip reduction program as currently proposed as well. So they wanted to make the point known that they were still supportive of their, of their initial position. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Rex. And from the E-470 Authority, Director Dyack. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we had a couple of uh, briefings, dashboards. Uh, one was finance and one was operational. Um, Takeaway of that, traffic volumes are continuing to increase on E-470. We are up year to date to 2017 levels. Last month, we were at 2016 levels. So that's a, that's a good move. Uh, and with the increased levels, we have moved to increase the number of hours that the Colorado State Patrol is going to support E-470 due to the increased traffic volume. That is the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Steve, Director White. Good evening, board. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a, a three quick things to share tonight, um, just to follow up on Director Stoltzman's quick mention of Glenwood Canyon. I'm sure everyone saw that on Monday or on Saturday, we were able to open one lane in each direction. I just want to note the uh, incredible effort that that has involved. Um, for those who haven't followed that closely, we uh, had a 500-year flood event up there. Um, that resulted in a level of debris falling down that mountainside that has caused our teams to have thousands of truckloads of uh, dirt and rock, including rocks the size of trailer homes, be moved out of there. Um, the governor declared a state of emergency. We have requested $116 million in emergency funding, did receive an uh, $11.6 million almost immediately from the feds, which is great, or hopeful we will um, get the remaining amount. Uh, there's just a lot of work um, remaining. And as luck would have it, we're expecting more rain tonight. Um, so when I left work tonight, we had uh, closed the canyon again, just in, uh, out of an abundance of, of caution there. So speaking of climate change, <laughs> um, the other thing I'll touch on is uh, uh, revitalizing Main Streets. We got an award, um, awards for 16 projects announced uh, on Monday. Uh, this was uh, using the 30 million we received from the state legislature. These were stimulus dollars that came in, kind of a, a one-time boost to that program. Um, so uh, look for that announcement. I think there were several projects in the Dr. Cog area. This was a program that will receive ongoing funding from Senate Bill 260. So RMS is now um, in statute um, with the first tranche of dollars that came in from that of, of 22 million. So CDOT's working to turn around another notice of funding availability um, very soon here. Uh, the last thing I'll note, you've already talked about quite a bit tonight, which was the release of the draft greenhouse gas rule. I just want to acknowledge uh, the tremendous um, team at Dr. Cog. Um, it, we couldn't have better uh, stakeholders and partners to think through some aspects of that role and really appreciate um, Ron Papsdorf um, and the modeling team there. I look forward to, to hearing you all uh, provide us some, what I think will be some tremendous feedback on that draft. Thank you, that's it for tonight. Thank you, Director White and Director Van Meter is not here this evening. And so I'll just note that in the packet, there's some informational items. Um, so please look those over and our next meeting September 15th, 2021. Are there any other matters by members tonight? 
Seeing that, we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, everyone. Good Be safe. Thank you. Au revoir. Good night. Good night.